When Vladimir Putin decided to invade Ukraine, he expected immediate victory. He wagered that Russian troops would easily overwhelm their Ukrainian counterparts, that Russia would be welcomed as liberators, and that the Zelensky government would fall within two days of fighting. In fact, the Russian army is taking heavy losses. Opinion in Ukraine has hardened against Russia after the shelling of schools and hospitals, and the Zelensky government can count on unprecedented support, both inside and outside the country. All this is to say, Putin's war isn't just criminal. Even on his own terms, it's proved to be a catastrophic mistake. What follows from that fact is complex, though. While it might be a relief to see a dictator not get his way, a mistaken war can also be a long and deadly one. Just look at Iraq. And so the Ukrainians now face a difficult choice. Sensing Putin's weakness, should they fight until the end, or expecting a desperate Russia to lash out with ever more destructive weaponry, should they try and strike a deal? On the latter front, it's at least possible that Putin will be more amenable to compromise now that his initial assumptions about the overwhelming strength of Russia's army have been shattered. And there are already some signs of a climb down. At the start of the war, Putin encouraged the Ukrainian army to overthrow their government who he characterized as drug addicts and Nazis. Today, a spokesperson for the Russian foreign ministry said regime change was never their intention. And on Russia's current thinking, a piece in the Jerusalem Post is particularly interesting. It's based on sources privy to details of a meeting between Putin and Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Zelensky can fortify Ukraine's independence but will have to pay a heavy price, the sources said. Assumptions are that he will be forced to give up the contested Donbass region, officially recognize the pro-Russian dissidents in Ukraine, pledge that Ukraine will not join NATO, shrink his army and declare neutrality. If he declines a proposal, the outcome may be terrible. Thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of Ukrainians will die. And there is a high probability that his country will completely lose its independence. Those would be incredibly painful conditions to swallow. Ukraine, for very good reason, doesn't trust its neighbour. Neutrality and a smaller army are not attractive propositions for a country currently subject to an illegal invasion. But as the article suggests, the alternative could be worse. In an ABC interview on Tuesday, Zelensky was asked to respond to Russia's offer. Mr. President, I wanted to get your reaction to what the Kremlin announced just a short time ago. They called these conditions to end this war. They said you must change your constitution to give up your wishes uh, to join NATO, that you uh, should recognize Crimea as part of Russia, and that you recognize the independence of those two Russian separatist regions in the east. Are you willing to go along with all three of those conditions? What is your message to Vladimir Putin right now? First, I'm ready for a dialogue. Uh, we're not ready for the uh, capital, uh, capitulation because it's not me. This is about the people who um, elected me. Regarding NATO, I am have I have cooled down regarding this question a long time ago. Um, the, after we understood that Russia is not that NATO is not prepared to accept Ukraine, the alliance is uh, afraid of controversial things and uh, confrontation with Russia. I never wanted to be a country which is begging something on its knees, and we are not going to to be that country. And I don't want to be that president. That sounded like Zelensky was pretty willing to compromise on NATO. Indeed, you could read Zelensky as preparing the Ukrainian population for a future climb down. We won't join NATO, but they were useless anyway. But the host wasn't satisfied with that conciliatory answer, so he tried again. When the Kremlin says these three conditions to end the war, that you must give up on joining NATO, recognize Crimea as part of Russia, and recognize the independence of those two separatist regions in the east, to Vladimir Putin, who will get this message up from you, you say it's a non-starter, not willing to those three conditions right now? No, there. The question is less neutral. When he asked the question straight, he got a conciliatory answer. Now he's saying to Vladimir Putin, who might be watching right now, do you say, screw your conditions? But this isn't the build up to a wrestling match. This is people's lives on the line. Let's go back to Zelensky's answer. I'm talking about security guarantees. I think that items regarding temporary occupied territories 
and unrecognized uh, republics that have not been recognized by anyone but Russia, these pseudo republics, but we can discuss and find a compromise or on how these territories will live on. What is important uh, to me is how the people in those territories are going to live who want to be part of Ukraine. Who in Ukraine will say that they want to have them in. So the question is more difficult than simply acknowledging them. This is another ultimatum, and we are not prepared for ultimatums. What needs to be done is for President Putin to start talking, start the dialogue, instead of living in the informational bubble without oxygen. I think that's where he is. He is in this bubble. He's getting this information, and you don't know how realistic that information is that he's getting. I think it's a bit like in the smoke and mirror situation. Again, that was a much more conciliatory answer than what the host appeared to be angling for. Zelensky didn't say the demands were a non-starter like the host asked. In fact, he suggested the future of Donetsk and Luhansk could be up for debate. And he didn't even mention Crimea. Might he have accepted, like most experts believe, that Ukraine is never getting it back? Of course, whatever the Ukrainians do or don't agree with the Russians, it's a matter for the Ukrainians. It's not for me to say whether they should agree to demands made at gunpoint or whether they should continue and fight. But I do worry some commentators outside Ukraine are more interested in punishing Russia and making an example of them than protecting lives. Referring to America's refusal to confront Russia's military directly, New Statesman columnist Bruno Mackays said, at this point, given the messages coming from Washington, the only reason China does not invade Taiwan is it does not want to. China declares an air exclusion area, controls the air, every expert starts screaming any attempt to protect Taiwan's airspace would mean nuclear war with China, game over. Now, I just don't get this. Mackay's implication is that unless American planes shoot Russian ones out of the sky, a green light has been given for other nuclear powers to attack smaller neighbours over which they have designs. But that ignores all the costs Russia is facing without a hot war with NATO. Russia's economy is crippled, its military is drained, and their only option is to raise cities to the ground or occupy a people that hate them. It's not an example China or anyone rational would follow. We should also hear talk about sanctions, because these are the main costs which is currently being imposed on Russia, as I've suggested. And I, of course, as I've said on this show, I do think sanctions in this instance, they're not always legitimate. In this instance, they are. Russia mounted a war of aggression. It deserves a response. But the attitude of some has also got me concerned. At the start of the war, the iPaper columnist and host of Romaniacs, Ian Dunt, said, Western sanctions against Russia must be devastating. Nothing else is acceptable. And that does seem to be the approach the West have taken since then. Central bank assets are frozen. Virtually all international firms have fled the country and sanctions are now endangering lives. Our guest from Monday's show, Anton Barbashin, said, Russian pharmacy is where sanctions would be felt the worst and very soon. Pharmacy producers warn that 80 to 85% of Russian drugs are produced with foreign compounds. EU supplies are gone. Supplies from China and India are affected by sanctions, contracts being drawn, etc. Again, and I should be clear, Putin is to blame more than anyone else for these sanctions. He started a war in Ukraine and his airstrikes are killing way more people than this round of sanctions will. But policy shouldn't just be about righteousness. It should be about producing desired effects. And a recent article about sanctions levelled on Japan shows how what might seem like a sensible policy can dramatically backfire. In the National Security Journal, War on the Rocks, Eric Sand and Suzanne Freeman write, In August 1941, excrement was piling up in Tokyo, literally. Most of the city lacked a sewer system and human waste had to be regularly trucked away from homes. In late July, the United States had frozen Japanese assets and embargoed oil sales to Japan to oppose the Japanese war in China. There was no longer enough fuel for the motor vehicles that normally transported the sewage out of the city and bicycle-drawn carts could not keep up with demand. Residents complained loudly. The American sanctions created more than just sewage problems and Japanese leaders came to believe they would lose power if they did nothing. They also believed they would lose power if they abandoned the war in China. As a result, Tokyo expanded the war and attacked Pearl Harbor. 
Critically, the Japanese cabinet chose to attack the United States even after it received analysis which reached the unequivocal conclusion that war with the United States was unwinnable. So, following an aggressive war against China, the US put heavy sanctions on Japan. But the effect of that wasn't that Japan pulled out of China, it was that they declared war on the United States. And significantly, that was even when they knew it was a war they would lose. So are there parallels here? As we keep being told, Russia's military is already overstretched in Ukraine. They aren't about to launch a war against the UK or America. But that doesn't mean they don't have potential means to escalate. We talked on this show before about the dangers of nuclear war. Laurie Garrett, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist on pandemics, had a worrying tweet about another potential threat. I'm in a background meeting now where military experts say Putin may use chemical weapons in Ukraine. They point to a widespread disinfo campaign claiming there are US-run labs all over Ukraine, which will be cited as Putin claims a US or Ukraine released gases, not Russia. Scary. Is this intelligence accurate? I honestly have no idea. But to my mind, the overwhelming drive in both our press and politics to punish Putin above all else seems incredibly risky. Yes. Putin is a war criminal who deserves whatever is coming to him, but this isn't an action movie. If the baddie is driven to act in an ever more brutal and irresponsible fashion, that's not just a dramatic interlude before he ultimately falls. It's people's livelihoods and people's lives. So let's be serious about this. This is a war. It's not cosplay. It's not an action movie. 